Hello and welcome back to the Impact Lounge and as always this week we're doing the Impact Review. I'm your host Adam and as always I'm joined by Ro. Good afternoon or good morning to you Ro. Good afternoon to you Adam. How you doing? Superb. Scotland is basking in beautiful sunshine and I've been out in the garden all day uh, with my top off. Yes, that's a horrible thought for those who can know what I look like. But yeah, I've been out there sunbathing, drinking. Well, I'm not going to reveal what I've been drinking just yet because it's going to be a question later on. Right. OK, uh, on to this week's uh, review. And before we do that, though, we're going to ask you if it's the first time you're stopping by the channel to hit that subscribe button. Uh, we're trying to get our view listenership up to 4,000 listeners. And uh, we can only do that if people like yourselves listening right now are already subscribed. And if you do subscribe, you'll hear a lot of great content like Rose Explosion Review, a lot of other material that BQ loads up during the week and other interviews such as the one I did yesterday with Moose. So that'll be coming this week. It's a fairly short interview, but there's some nice little nuggets in there and I think you'll like it. So, as I said, hit the subscribe button and like us, dislike us, whatever you want to do. If you're listening on YouTube or whatever podcast site that you, you get this show on, make sure you leave us some comments too. We're going to be asking questions throughout the show for your opinions on things and answering some listeners' questions as well. Right, so before we start, we usually have a bit of a shout out for some of our podcasting colleagues out there in the on the internet, not in the internet. We're not in uh, Tron just yet. Uh, yeah, so this week we're going to be calling out uh, a shout out to the Clock Cleaners on YouTube. They're guys who are associated with Andrew Corbeil's Wrestling with Wrestling.com website. So they do good stuff. They don't just do impact. They do other wrestling as well. So if you get a chance to listen to, as I always say, one podcast, listen to ours. If you get a chance to listen to two, check those guys out as well. Right. So um, you'll... I just mentioned that I was drinking something. Um, one of the things I'm, Ro and I are going to try and do each week, and I'm springing this on Ro now as well. He's wondering where I'm going with this. Is uh, we're going to give you a bit of a brain teaser each week as well. We're going to start off with a nice gentle one this week, uh, a bit of trivia for you. So uh, as I said, I've been out in the garden today having a drink, and uh, I'll give you a clue. It's an alcoholic drink. And what we want to know is what am I drinking? And uh, to give you a clue, <laughs> we're not going to just ask you to guess randomly, but I am drinking Christopher Daniels' signature drink. So there you go. Let us know in the comments. What was it I was drinking during this show today? Do you know, Ro, without telling the answer? I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, one of the other things we did last week, um, we answered uh, one of the listeners' questions. And once again, we'd uh, implore you to uh, have a think about leaving us some questions because, you know, we're always looking for other things to talk about just than the show itself. So this week, uh, we're going to talk about a question left to us by Richard Cartledge. Hope you said his name right. Uh, who asked us, who would you guys like to see as world champion who hasn't held it already? So uh, I'll go first. I'll give Ro a chance to have a think about his answer because once again, I've sprung this on him. But uh, to answer your question, Richard, the guy I'd like to see hold the world championship, and I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about a good six months into the future, possibly the end of the year, maybe the beginning of the next, but it's Santana from LAX. I think this guy, wrestling ability is great. He's got some good chops on him. He's got a good look. Obviously part of a tag team at the moment, which is the main focus, but I think this guy can be a future world champion. So so that's my one. Have you got anything for us for on this? Yeah, my guy, I would have to say Johnny Impact. And I know it's probably funny seeing that all the opportunities that he has, but when you think about his whole wrestling career as a whole, I think being world champion has been the championship that's eluded him. Every company that he's been in, a lot of times, He's reached mid-card status, and I think an impact, that world title reign, that can really do him wonders. So that would be somebody I'd like to see get a shot at the title. And it doesn't necessarily have to be some long six-month reign. I mean, you give him a, a couple months, but just so he can get that on his resume. I, I think it's a good shout out. You know, I, I've often criticized his wrestling move set just because it doesn't look very impactful. But uh, he's a good guy, a solid pair of hands. And I think, you know, he could be the face of a company. Uh, I'd like to see him do it as a heel if he was going to do it. Uh, but yeah, uh, not a bad shout out. So thanks for that question, Richard. And uh, yeah, keep them coming. If anyone else has got a question they'd like Ro and I to tackle next week, 
just, just drop us a comment uh, in the section below this video and we'll do our best to answer it. If we get quite a few, we can only answer one and we'll keep it for a, a future show, but we will get round to them all eventually. Right, so all of you stopped by to listen to the Impact Review, so let's dive straight into it. What did you make of the show, Ro, overall? I felt it was fair, um, and I don't want to be overly critical, but I did have a couple of criticisms. Um, and some parts were entertaining, but I wasn't as ga as engaged as I have been in the past couple uh, episodes. I, th I think you're right. And, uh, you know, we always try and get some positives out of the show. And there was quite a few positives in there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll tackle the, you know, the, each segment in a little while. But I think as far as this new creative and management team are concerned, I, I reckon this is always probably the weakest show they've put out uh, since taking over. But having said that, they've been on a, you know, a very high bar. They've set a really high standard. So, you know, if this was the weakest show, it still wasn't as bad as some of the ones that we had on Destination America. So, um, yeah, it, it wasn't great, but uh, it certainly wasn't awful. So before I start, I've got a question for you, Ro. See if you know the answer. Who, which uh, impact superstar, I'd hate to use that, rest, that, that term, impact uh, character was featured the most on this week's show. Do you know? No, I don't. And you know what? I just watched it uh, last night. I actually watched it uh, late this week. <laughs> Tell me why that baffles me. <laughs> it, it was a debut, believe it or not. It was the board of directors door. That was the, the thing that was featured the most on this show this week. Nearly every match, we had a close-up of the door for a good 30 seconds. Uh, so, yeah, it was a trick question. Um, I found it very highly amusing that we kept on cutting away from the matches to go and look at a door that wasn't opening. Um, but, yeah, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm sure okay. we cover that. <laughs> I, you, you finally realise what I'm on about, right? Uh, yeah, so it, it was just something that kind of frustrated me all the way through the show that they kept on saying, oh, oh, let's, let's go and check in. Uh, yeah, the door's still closed. Uh, <laughs> so anyway uh onto the show let's get into it proper shall we uh i will say one thing i thought that the opening vignette was was very good you know i liked how josh matthews talked about all of the stuff that's been going on with callahan and don Callis and thing i i i think it's great I, i'm amazed actually in this day and age that people are still believing that it was something that happened in real life you know it, it wasn't a part of a storyline i don't know if you notice this on, uh, online you know, I, I seen with it, um, and yeah, as I think as re regarding Callahan, I think he, some people, maybe the ones who don't follow Impact like we do or other fans, you know, they look at him as being careless, not realizing like this is all part of a angle, you know, storyline driven. So, but that's great. That's what you want. And Sammy Callahan, I mean, 2018, he's been the hottest act, you know, to piggyback off who we were saying as far as, uh, who we would like to see champion. He's another guy, I mean, further, further down the road, obviously. But, yeah, he, he's been a hot act. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, at the moment, he's most probably making the most money he's ever made because he is super... Out of all the guys on the independent scene, I think he's the one that people talk about the most at the moment. And he's doing brilliantly for himself. Fair play to him. Right, so let's... Uh, after that, you know, they showed the attack and things. What, what did you think of it, by the way, before we move on? Do you like this angle that they've taken? Do you think it's it's pointless? Do you, do you what, what, just what do you think of it? I like it, but then too, in later on, it kind of assured me that okay, you know, um, things are still continuing with him and Eddie Edwards. But I kind of just thought, as as much as I liked it, I'm like, oh, it's it seems too much jumping around. We've seen this kind of with Callahan, where when uh, Lashley was still with the company. He attacks Lashley. They have their mini feud. Then it goes on to Eddie Edwards. They have their thing. Now he's going on to Callis. So I would like for him to kind of continue with one thing. And like I said, later on, we kind of get that assurance that, okay, there's the his uh, issues with Eddie Edwards are still there. But yeah, I, I like it. And, you know, the one thing I want to say what Don Callis said, and even though some of these shows, some are going to be good, some are going to be not so good. The one thing, and I, I'm in agreement with Callis on is Impact Wrestling this year has been the hottest thing in wrestling. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think they've done wonderfully, uh, you know, building from, although some would say quite a low point, uh, they're doing very, very well and they're doing all the right things. So uh, let, we'll come back onto that because, as I said, it was featured heavily during the show. Anyway, the door. So uh, we'll come back to the door later on. It actually reminded me of, of a time I, I saw a concert and uh, it was Tenacious D. I don't know if you, if you know these guys, Jack Black's band. Uh, I went to see them in Glasgow and the support act was this comedian and uh, he kept on hinting that it was time for Tenacious D to come on. And uh, and the crowd were, were you know, getting restless, thinking, God, when's this comedian going to finish? It was a guy called Neil Hamburger. Brilliant name, by the way. Um, anyway, he kept on, t- you know, uh, teasing that it's no time for Tenacious D, no time. And, and he kept on doing something else. And eventually he, he got booed off stage and people were throwing things at him because he, he eventually said, and now it's time to introduce the things you come here for. Tenacious D's curtain and, and, the, and the curtain opened there was another curtain behind anyway that's what this show reminded me of are you wondering why i was going off on a tangent there but the, the shot of the door I, i'm gonna keep bringing back to it it was just ridiculous it was ridiculous anyway let's move on recap of the last couple of weeks eli drake and pentagon jr another great package and if nothing else what impact doing with these packages are top notch I really like the recaps they do. I'm not not so much a big fan of some of the creepy stuff like when Ali was looking in the window and when Sammy was going to the hotel rooms. I don't like the editing of those, but the the actual recaps, I think, uh, are second to none, especially when you compare it to Bobby Lashley's stuff that was on uh, WWE this week, which was terrible. I just, you know, and not to dive in too much on that end, but... uh... I see that uh, his finisher is a suplex, that delayed suplex. <laughs> and I was just like, as strong and powerful as this guy is, he's beating people with a suplex. I mean, you know what, to each his own, but I think that's one thing, too, where Impact gives a lot of these people the freedom, where, you know, the one thing with Jade, I even use Jade, for example, and she used to use a package pile driver. And a lot of times when you see people go over there, especially women, the women are limited, whereas the knockouts, they're not limited. You look at some of the movesets. I mean, you know, they are able to do, you know, some some crazy stuff. So, yeah, I I thought that was funny seeing him (laughs) beat somebody with a a suplex delayed, mind you. But hey, anyway. Right. So uh, let's go on to the proper show then. So the first matchup was uh, Z and E versus LAX, the battle of the initials. Uh, I'm just going to dive straight into here about DJ Z and Andrew Everett. It's about time we got, uh, you know, a face tag team, you know, <laughs> who high flyers, you know, high energy, those kind of things. But I just don't like Andrew Everett. I don't know what it is. I, you know, I always talk highly of most people on the roster. You know, I like the cult of Lee. I like both of those guys that, I like DJ Z, but Andrew Everett just annoys me. I think it's that sticking the tongue thing out. I don't know, but he just he just annoys me. What what, what did you make of him and this match? Well, I, I like Andrew Everett. I think, you know, you look at him and, you know, he's not, you know, he, yeah, he's a smaller guy, but he's not really cut up. And he's able to fly like his moves. He, they're done effortlessly. And I think... You know, I, I've spoke about DJ Z. You know, I'm glad to see him back, and hopefully, they have some plans with him in the foreseeable future. I love his interest in music. I think stuff's pretty awesome. Um, as far as the match, great. And I think, you know, we have been talking about LAX, how you know they tend to get stale relatively quick. Not their fault, you know, because they've run through a lot of the tag teams. But now that they've taken the belt off of them, and you have. Conan missing in action we hear about King and you kind of see them kind of uh it looks like there's some dissension and I think that's good for them because that you know they've established themselves as a tag team that they're always going to be in the title picture so I think having them lose this match this gives them kind of it it uh carries on to the troubles that they've had and as far as with DJ Z and Everett I love the tag team and I really hope that this is this isn't just kind of like a one-time deal that they really kind of commit to it because I think you can get a lot of mileage out of these guys. Yeah, I think you can. I think, you know, they're, they're crying out for a face tag team, you know, because let's face it, who have they got? they got OVE, yeah, LAX, they're tweener, if for want of a better term, Scott Steiner, Eli Drake. You know, I know they're supposed to be face, but the crowd love them, but they're not a face tag teams. So there really isn't that many face tag teams in there. Even Falabar and KM, you know, it's a strange mix, but 
they're not a face tag team and these guys can be that face tag team you know they could be this era's you know motor city machine guns or whatever you want to call them you know so um what i would say about this match though is that it just didn't feel like it clicked for me and it was fine. There were some lovely moves. There were some transitions that was great. You know, LAX, as I said, are always great. But I just feel that if you did this match again, it would be better next time. I, I just don't feel they got into a rhythm that was right. And it, it just felt disconnected to me. I don't know why. I didn't watch it thinking, wow, wow, wow. It was just, uh-huh, okay, all right. Oh, that didn't look smooth. You know, all these kind of things. So, yeah, it, it was a bit disappointing, the match, because I thought it could be better. And I know if you put these guys in the ring again, it would be better next time. I don't know if you got the same feeling. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I think what happened, it seemed, it, I mean, if you if you, if I told you a triple threat X Division match consisting of Santana, Everett, and DJZ, would, you'd be sold on that, would you not? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You notice who I didn't include in that. And I think what, what kind of might have taken it away, like I, I enjoyed the match, but I think they were going X Division and then until Ortiz got into that, I don't think Ortiz can work that style. I mean, his, what he does alone is, is great as it is, but I think he doesn't fit kind of the X, the X Division style. So I think that's what kind of threw it off because anytime Santana was in the match and, you know, he was interacting with DJ Z or Andrew Everett, we were kind of getting that fast paced X Division style. Whereas when Ortiz got in it was more hard hitting i didn't notice that but that makes a lot of sense and you know i'll look out for that if i if i go back over the match or if they do it again but uh yeah as i said i think these guys have got uh uh you know another level to go to and uh this just didn't hit it for me all right let's move on to grado backstage with joseph park and uh i, I know grado comes in for a lot of criticism as does joseph park but this was this this was serviceable it was all right what was strange about it was that Catriona debuted in this segment and she's still looking amazing by the way uh, but <laughs> yeah but they didn't reference winter at all which is obviously who she played last time she was in uh, or TNA as it was then do you think they will go back to the winter character or do you, oh, I noticed her name when it appeared on screen during the match it was Catriona do you, where, where do you think they'll go with this you know that's interesting I didn't even think about that because I don't know if her and you know we just obviously got to see how things play out i mean i don't know if she was just brought in or she's just gonna work as a valet or if they have plans to integrate her into the knockouts division you know whether they do or not i mean i don't think it's a big deal but they should i don't and i don't re recall them mentioning it but it'd be nice to uh mention her being a two-time knockouts champion because i mean she was so I mean, I don't know. It just depends what they what they have for her. What are the plans? I mean, to see her play in Grado's girlfriend. I mean, <laughs> fellas, man, you see someone, shoot your shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I've got to say, Joseph Park did sell the, sell it quite well. How hot she was. But yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, uh, obviously, then we had a, a bit. Of, we'll come back to those two in a second. But then we had a little break when it showed Eli Drake versus Scott Steiner, uh, and St Scott Steiner versus DJ Everett. DJ Everett, DJ Z, and Andrew Everett next week, and obviously that's going to be a tag tag team title. So uh, we're saying about we hope we, these guys stick together. It looks like they are going to be wrestling again next week. It seems strange that they've gone straight into the title scene, but I suppose they just beat the former champs, so that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I'm guessing that was an impromptu number one contenders match. Hmm. So um, then we ha went on to the match with Grado versus uh, Rohit Raju. And it, I've got to say, Grado seemed super over in the impact crowd. I don't know if you noticed that. They really seemed into it. Yeah, um, actually, if I just might mention just real, real quick, before the match, we actually got the promo with Austin Aries stating that he hopes Drake wins tonight because he wants to win his other world championship back so once again he's referencing the, his grand title as being a world champion i really i really wish they kind of give us some more clarification on that because you know if the belt's gonna not be used anymore there's no point seeing him walking around having him carried on his shoulder but yeah um back to the match for, as far as rohit raju and grado yeah um grado's always been over with the impact fans um, you know, him being a comedy character and whatnot, that's fine. I mean, I think you need a little bit of mix of everything. 
not everyone can be like we always say challenging for the world title. Yeah, he but he's always been over with the impact crowd. He um he seemed a bit more serious this time. And what I mean by that, his his moves seem to have more viciousness to them and power. Yeah, I mean he's still a comedy character and there were some comedy spots in it, but he seemed a bit more serious in the ring. I don't know if that came over to you as well. Um, I mean, I still seen kind of the old Grado. I will say this, and I mean, he got the win, which I mean <laughs> probably could count on my fingers how many matches Grado has won in Impact. But I will say with Rohit Raju, and I'm confused with him because they still reference the Desi Hit Squad. And for those of you who follow Explosion, Rohit Raju's kind of been a mainstay on there, which I think is a good place for him. Gives him an opportunity to get on TV and hone his craft a little bit because he's still a little bit green in some some ends. But, you know, to have him lose like that, I mean, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, it's no big deal, but... I, I think as far as with the Desi Hit Squad and them kind of referencing it, I would kind of wish they kind of, you know, kept it to a minimum until he gets a significant push where you can debut the group because if they debuted the group in within the next couple of weeks. You're going to look at it as it not being such a big deal since he's a part of it and he hasn't really been on the winning end much. So, I mean, you know, like we always say, the theme of these reviews is, you know, we'll see how things play out, but... Yeah, that, that was just my thing. But as far as Grado, I mean, he still seems like the same comedy Grado. I mean, you think of the spot that they had where Rohit Raju was trying to German Grado and Grado was just standing there like, all right, try one more time. You know, normally you don't see a wrestler, you know, just waiting for, to take the move. Normally they're trying to reverse it. So, yeah. It's the kind of thing you see at a house show, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a house show kind of spot. Um, but yeah, you're right. And, and I hope they do something with Raju because he was great on the teleconference that we did. And, you know, he really has got a good set. Uh, you know, I keep saying set of chops on him, you know, to to talk. You know, he, he's a, a good talker. So uh, let's hope that, you know, the, when he does get his hit squad with him, that they kind of start picking up some wins because he's getting into that real uh well i'm trying to think of someone who well richard justice league almost you know in that uh he's never going to be picking up wins by the you know you can't actually see him as a, a legitimate threat in any of these matches right one thing i, I found strange is at the very end of the match it looked like uh rajat was going to cut a promo but then they cut backstage i don't know if you if you noticed that at all uh, it really did look like he was about to say something and address the crowd but then they said oh something's going on backstage and then obviously we had Joseph Park knocked out and Grado completely over the top acting of calling a doctor. You know, I and I thought that would have been an excellent way if, you know, to have him talk about, hey, you know, I might have lost. But, you know, when the Desi hits, they could have used that to kind of give us some clarification as far as who is the Desi hit squad. And I, I thought the same thing too, that they were going to cut into a promo and then they just rushed to backstage. I, I thought that was odd. So, you know, maybe someone who attended this taping could share that in the comments, you know, was something uh, taped or I'm sorry, not taped, but did he deliver a promo and then they just not air it or what happened with that? Cause it did seem odd. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, um, we then moved on to another excellent vignette about Tessa Blanchard, which, you know, once again, I thought was just really, really well put together. Um, you know, it just tells you everything that you need to know about that character and her motivation. So I thought it was excellent. Yeah, this put her over as a big deal. And I like when they do things like that because it gets someone invested. If you're not someone who's followed, has followed her work, you you know you're you're seeing something like this and you're going to look forward to what she does in impact so we'll move on from that and we'll go backstage with Mackenzie mitchell eli and scott this was great you know these well all, well first of all Mackenzie looked fab but both eli and scott delivered great promos and there was almost a little bit of dissension between the two uh, the, the highlight of it is when scott steiner said he had a freak last night and grabbed uh, mckenzie's arm and she looked in complete disgust that was the highlight of this part of it for me but uh, yeah it, it was good what, what did you think yeah i noticed the dissension as well um i'm sure we always could foresee that the tag team of Steiner and Eli Drake was going to be a short-term thing. I mean, I think them being champions, you know, it's awesome. It gives Eli a great rub to be, hold 
the tag team titles with one of the greatest tag team wrestlers in the history of the business. So yeah, I, f I did find that find that odd. You know, normally a heel wants the no the numbers game, so to have him kind of say, "Hey, I'm gonna do this myself." Um, yeah, it teased some dissension. I will say this before we move on, and I I think it might have been from an earlier package, but <laughs> the one thing that had me cracking up is when Eli Drake referred to Pentagon as a scary idiot. I don't know why I laughed so hard at that. It's not the greatest insult ever, is it? <laughs> it was just, it's just childish. Like that scary yeah. idiot. It was just some, I think maybe it was how he delivered it. It just, it yeah. had me just, I was laughing the whole night. I'm like a scary idiot. And that's just something so simple, you know, but I'm yeah. laughing. Uh, he's, good. he's fantastic on the mic. And you, he's one of the guys, you know, even if you didn't, you know, when I used to watch WWE, I pretty much watched it in fast forward and then just stopped at the end of matches and watched some promos. But, uh, and there was always certain things that I would stop for, you know, to watch. And and if if I did the same with Impact, I would always stop on Eli Drake promos because you know they're going to be quality. You know that he's always going to deliver something that's worthwhile. But anyway, let's move on to the uh, X Division number one contender match. Ishimori, Aerostar, Drago and Phantasma. Now, before I ask you your, your views on this, this was another match where you would think these four guys have most probably wrestled a lot. Certainly three of them are wrestled, uh, I would have thought, numerous times in the past, maybe not Ishimori, uh, together. But once again, it didn't click and it felt quite slow-paced to me and, and, and I just didn't enjoy it. It just... I didn't think it was spectacular at all. I, I liked Phantasma's finisher. I think that's, that's a really good finish, but it looks quite brutal. But I, I, I just didn't think much of this match at all. I would have preferred it just being Ishimori versus Phantasma. Nothing against Aerostar or Drago, but when they're doing moves, whether it's dives or it's something off the ropes, I'm always cringing because... You know, and one end I kind of think sometimes maybe it's something with the ropes, but then when you when you see someone like a Ishimori or Andrew Everett, I never have that feeling. Like I feel when they're doing their dives or springboard moves or even moves off the turnbuckle, it's so clean and crisp. Whereas like we've seen with Arrow start in a couple times in this match, especially the the dive to the outside. I mean, he fell in, 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 look, I know accidents happen, but it's just with some of these guys that they're bringing over, I know these guys are from Lucha Underground, but even when they had the AAA guys, and I don't know if maybe it's because with the mask, they're unable to see, and I know one of the things with Lucha is, you know, they tend to botch, but when they're doing some of their high-flying moves, man, I'm worried more for their safety than them actually connecting. They it, it just they don't seem as crisp compared to Ishimori and Phantasma. So, I mean, the match was fine. I would I think if you would have just given you know if I it would have just been Ishimori versus Phantasma, I think it would have been excellent. Yeah, I actually agree with you there. That you know I think that um, you know these guys they once again they could be putting on a better match. But I love the finisher. I do like the thrill of the kill. Although on the spoilers that I'm reading here, it does say that he delivered it on Ishimori, and uh, it was actually Aerostar that he delivered it on. But it's a it's a really good finisher. But it was very low key. The ending of the match as well. You know, usually with these things, all four of them hit their finishers, and then someone gets the pin. But I don't know. There was a lot of spots that seemed missed and fan. Um, Aerostar did an absolute sick dive to the outside where he landed on his head and folded his body like an accordion. Uh, it, you know, it just didn't click this match. And it was the same as I thought the, the Z and E match earlier on. It just didn't click for me. But anyway, let, let's move on. So then we finally saw the door open. Uh, at last, we saw some action and Eddie Edwards burst in to the Impact Executive Meeting. I don't know who was in the Executive Meeting. Uh, for some reason in my mind, I'd like to think that Jeff Jarrett and Dixie Carter are in there, but uh, I doubt they were. Uh, so, yeah, so Don Callis was obviously in there, and Eddie Edwards convinced them not to fire him. And uh, they said, that's fine. You'll still stay on the roster, but if you want to settle this, don't do it at one of our shows. So I'm guessing they're building to something at a House of Hardcore show or something like that. Yeah, I had no problem with this. Um, like I said, you know, earlier when I was talking about when we seen Callahan attack Don Callis, I had thought I was like, so does that mean that's the end between him and Eddie Edwards and he's moving on again? But we still see some continuance with these guys. And, you know, eventually we're going to get our big blow off match. But I'm looking forward to see what they do next. Yeah, um, I'm guessing it's going to be House of Hardcore. Um, and... 
I, I also liked how they then went back to Josh Matthews really selling the, the how solemn it was in the studio as well. Yeah, you know, it, and I, I will say throughout the show, he did a, a good job, you know, solo, solo commentary. It, it took me a while to realize, like, wait a minute, he's by himself, you, you know, so accustomed to having callous. But, you know, he, he did well, I, I must say. I thought so as well. Tyrus is a piece of shit <laughs> saying that he misses Dixie Carter, basically, didn't he? <laughs> well, you know what's so funny with him? I look. Because I think with Impact, you know, there's always a place for people. And I thought what was a missed opportunity with him, and they were, I mean, well, there's two, actually. I think his ceiling was always going to be some kind of monster tag team or monster stable. So I, I, I never I never thought of him as a world title, in, in the world title picture. Just because even we see, we seen in... Uh, um, even when he was in, with the other company, I mean, they gave him the dancing thing. He's not that really that um, intimidating monster type. Like compared to like a Congo Kong, if they put I could see them putting the world title on Kong, Congo Kong because he has that intimidation factor. Tyrus doesn't have it. It's more of just he's just this big, you know, overweight guy, you know, pretty much. And, you know, he thinks so highly of himself. And look. You know, more power to you, but I look at somebody's career where, I, and I don't know how long he's been wrestling for, but he, I don't, I can't recall him winning any world title, even in indie world belts. So to expect someone like Impact to put you in the world title picture is, is a bit much. He, he, you know, he's best at, as a bodyguard in that bodyguard role. I think he thinks because, you know, he's a big deal on CBS or whatever it is, or Fox News or whatever it may be that, you know, that's going to carry over into the wrestling ring. But anyway. So up next, we had uh, Moose versus Congo Kong from the House of Hardcore. And, you know, I don't mean to beat up this show too badly, but once again, this was just quite a disappointing match. You know, that there was nothing exciting for me in this match at all. Um, I found the wrestling quite pedestrian, it seemed like it was a house show. They were trying to, you know, not even do any big moves, but just going through the motions. And even the ending was was pretty low key, nondescript. Uh, what, what did you make of it? I didn't like it at all. At first, I thought their first interaction with one another should have happened in an impact ring, because this was kind of a big deal. You think about Kong 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 cause riding off of the momentum of putting Johnny Impact on the shelf. So to face Moose, that's a big deal for him. So I would have liked them to make it be a big deal. And to put it on House of Hardcore, if they had already had a couple matches underneath their belt, like you know we were talking about previously about Eddie Edwards and Sammy Callan, that's fine because their first interaction was in the Impact ring. And as far as the match, like you were saying, it was pedestrian. Like, And you, know, you get the cheap DQ finish and you, um, Moose... Clotheslines, Kong Kong out of the ring. Jimmy Jacobs holding back, and I mean, I don't know where they go next from here. I'm assuming that the feud's gonna continue, but I just really thought it was a weak, a, a, a weak showing. I mean, I didn't mind the ending so much because obviously, you know, it was filler, and you know, takes us on to a bigger rematch later on. So I have no problem with the ending. You know, it was, you know, watch this space. It was a cliffhanger, whatever you want to call it, but. Where I think they went wrong with this was that they kind of threw us into the match without giving us a reminder of all the things, of how we got to this place. And to throw us into such a a crap match, <laughs> to, to want a better word, it, it just c killed the momentum of the, the angle. You know, because it, it was building up really, really nicely. And then suddenly it also felt like you're halfway through the match when we joined it. It didn't feel like it was the beginning of the match, and I'm sure it wasn't because there was no ring entrances. There was nothing like that. It was just, oh, let's go to House of Hardcore where these two guys are fighting, and after a couple of minutes, uh, it's a DQ finish, and um, the monster's held back so we can do it somewhere else. I mean, it, it, this, this is the worst part of the show for me. Yeah, it didn't come across here. I think the the major thing was when we seen them promoting the match, and it just seemed like they promoted it because it was something that was filmed you know whenever it was filmed it didn't seem like something that they actually were like okay hey we're gonna uh pair these guys together and let them do their things and you see that like you say with the lack of interest entrances and, and it just seemed like where the match had already started once they aired it so 
you know, it was just a weak show, and I'm sure they'll follow it up with something better. But yeah, it it kind of took me out of the show. And one one final thing as well, I'd, I'd like to point out about it was that. I don't care that it was filmed at another place. I know you said that the first interaction should have been in the impact zone, which I agree with. But I don't have a problem with going to some of these places. And we'll talk about it with the, the Brian Cage match in a minute. And the same with Brian Cage's match last week. You know, sometimes these matches are really good, but this wasn't, you know. And I, I would rather that they didn't air this at all because they must have seen the footage and thought, this is rubbish. And I'd rather they would have just built it up so that the, the next time that they do face, which I'm guessing is going to be in an impact ring, would have been the first time and just kind of ignored the fact that this happened. But anyway, it is what it is. Uh, let's move on. Um, so then we had two of my favorites on the roster, KM giving a training montage to Falabar. Now, this is the stuff that I love in wrestling. And I always talk about... Uh, you know, I, I'm quite a fan of storyline and comedy and those kind of things. But they, they're doing exactly the right thing with these two at the moment. I really liked it. Yeah, you know, giving these guys something to do. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny because you see, uh, sorry, not KM, Fala, you know, exercising real hard. And <laughs> every scene, KM is stuff in his face. So, you know, one would assume that at the end of all this, Fall's gonna be in great shape and it's gonna be KM who's gonna be the one that needs to get in shape. But you know, giving these guys something to do, um, it's fine. You know, we have always stressed on these reviews and you know, overall that not everybody's gonna be challenging for the world title or hell, the mid card X division. So some guys you gotta find other ways to plug them in. Now, will they eventually pair up and challenge for the tag team titles? That remains to be seen, but for this, I, I have no problem with this. I thought it was uh, quite entertaining. Uh, for some reason, I could just watch uh, KM eat for 20 minutes to a 20-minute eating promo uh, and find it funny. Everything this guy does makes me laugh. And I know we interviewed him, and he, he was a great interview, and he was, he was a good guy. But I actually just really like him as a character, you know. Uh, the question earlier on from Richard Cartledge was, you know, can you see anyone who hasn't held the title who you'd like to see? I'd love to see KM. I don't think it's ever going to happen. But he's a guy who's got, once again, he can talk and he's got a look that could be, he's like Sid Justice, you know, build-wise. He's massive. Uh, I don't think they'll ever put him onto him because he's too comedy at this point. But I like him. It's a shame that they didn't go further with the uh, America's Top Team angle because they were kind of developing a serious side to him at that point. And when that fell apart, they, they, they didn't really know what to do with KM. But he seems like a real pro in the business in that he doesn't talk bad about impact. He seems happy to be there and he seems happy to do whatever they tell him to do. And sometimes I know that, you know, wrestlers have got to, you know, come up with good decisions about their own career. But he just seems genuinely happy to be on television and enjoying himself. And and I think every promotion needs that, you know, and, and fair play to him. I'd love to see him do something bigger and better, but not fundamentally change his character. I think, though, with his attitude, like you were just saying, and we see that with a lot of guys, for the most part, in Impact and gals, that's uh, eventually rewarded down the road. Now, how's it rewarded? I'm sure he's going to hold some kind of gold. Which kind of gold? It remains to be seen, obviously. But I think having that attitude where he's like, hey, you know, whatever you're going to give me, I'm going to make the most of it. And we see that because this is stemming back to remember when he had the vignettes. Um, the one that comes to mind is with the pizza guy. And he's like, are you calling me a liar? You know, when he was doing all of that. You know, being able to whatever management is giving him and I and I'm, I can understand if it's something that's degrading, but whatever management is giving him and just taking the ball and running with it, he's going to be rewarded down the road. I mean, if you wanted to put him in the title picture, I think and I will always say this it's just a matter of creative getting behind the certain individual and just committing to it. I mean, if they do that, if they were d decided, you know, to scrap the comedy aspect and just make him just be kind of the neighborhood bully where he just goes and just beats people up, you know, with ease. I mean, you could build off of that, but it, it's up to creative on what they have to do for do with him. But kudos to him for whatever impact management is giving him. He's just taking it and running with it. Mm. And you said about the bully, yeah, you're quite right. You know, they gave that to Ryback in WWE, and uh, yeah, I could see him doing something similar. And I know he was going down that route, and you never know; he might switch back to that. But 
I, I just really like the guy, you know, and every company needs a safe pair of hands. And I'm not saying he's a safe pair of hands because he's not, you know, uh, a, a, t- a top face or heel, but he's just consistently good and he's entertaining. And, and that's what I want from wrestling. I don't care if someone can put on a five-star clinic. You know, it doesn't bother me. You know, don't get me wrong, it's nice to see at times, especially if the guy could talk as well. But, you know, you look at someone like AJ Styles, I'm not comparing KM to AJ Styles. By the way, our listeners will go nuts if I say, oh, yeah, KM's as good as AJ Styles. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that AJ Styles was amazing in the ring. Okay on the mic, not brilliant. But KM has got so much more personality than AJ Styles ever had in his career. And I'm not, uh, I, I don't even know what I'm trying to say at this point. But the point being is that KM is a likable guy and I could watch him every single week on my telly doing something, whether it's a mid-card belt, whether it's a comedy angle like this. KM has absolutely got a place in wrestling, whereas AJ Styles, oh, well, I can watch him every week as well. But the point I'm making is that I'm more entertained by characters like KM. And I think sometimes people like that should really be rewarded with a a push for the belt. And they did it in WWE with uh, JBL. You know, that he was never the wrestler that that should have been, you know, holding a world title. But he was consistently entertaining in the mid card. And eventually they gave him the ball and ran with it. And I could see KM doing that. I really could. And I hope at some point they do give him a chance. And I don't care if it's a secondary title, but when they give him that chance, don't just give him the, you know, the gold or thanks for that. A bit like Christine Cage we're talking about on um, the the, the Impact Throwback Bounge that we do. Um where he came in and he was rewarded for his hard work. And when he went back to WWE, he got a token title. I would like to see KM hold a title and hold it for a good six to nine months, whether that's the grand championship or whatever, and just really give him a run with it. Yeah, I, you know who, who would be the best example to use is uh, Eli Drake. You think about his arrival. He started with the rising, then he was kind of meddling. Um, you know, he was losing. I think he had lo- he lost a Grado at one point. And finally he got the break where um during that time they had the king of the mountain title and i mean when he was champion i mean you could tell he was a proud champion and then you fast forward to now where you know he's the guy so i and i think with km you know right now like i said he's doing whatever manager is asking of him and making the most of it so i think he will be rewarded um i could see the mid card if you ask me Personally, I think maybe a mid-card title reign is in his future because I think somebody like him, you know, could you imagine if he was grand champion coming out every week, uh, <laughs> cutting the most ridiculous promos, talking about I'm grand champion. That means I'm the best thing in this company and et cetera, et cetera. It would just it would be fun. So we just have to wait and see. But I think that's great when you have a wrestler that's going to be patient. And I think impact is, has shown in it. Most recently, I would say that, you know, patience, it, it pays off. I, I would, I could actually see him like the honky tonk man and not as interesting like Elvis, but as in he was the longest reigning intercontinental champ, but he used to cheat and do everything to keep that title. And I could imagine that you could give KM something like that, where he could become, you know, the longest reigning um, grand champion or, or whatever it is, you know, something, a mid card title where he could hold it, but every week somehow he manages to get out with the win because he gets disqualified or whatever and really build some heat. You know, it doesn't matter if he loses on house shows, but on all the televised products every week, you know, he continues. And I think that he, he would be made for a role like that. Um, and another thing is, as well, my enthusiasm for him. I'd like to think that it's now spreading because I listened to, to BQ's Impact review last week. And he started talking about KM as well, saying about how much he likes him. So I, I think that's down to my enthusiasm. Let's start it here, listeners. Let's start it here. Let's get some hash, some, some something trending on Twitter or wherever it is. Let's get KM as a, as a champion somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> he deserves it. KM for president. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, next... Uh, we talked about um, the going to the House of Hardcore for the Congo Kong match and saying that, you know, I didn't have a problem with it. And this is the perfect example. Brian Cage, uh, well, I t- was it pro wrestling? No, he was wrestling in. This was the match of the night. This was fantastic. This match was absolutely amazing. By far the highlight of the night. See, and before I get into the match, I think this is the one thing Impact has to get away from because it can come across as filler. And I'm not saying this particular match, but when you have back-to-back matches that are taped in another promotion and they air it on Impact, it could come across as filler. With that said, this 
was you, like I'm in, in agreement with you. This was a match of the night, and man, you know there were so many times in this match where uh, I can't pronounce his last name, but Takashi, I really thought he was gonna be, beat Brian Cage. And you like that. And that's why I said, you know, I've been stating in the past where we're seeing some progression in his matches where he's not just running through guys. Like, I know we had compared maybe he's going to get a Goldberg push. Yeah, he's undefeated. But his matches, I mean, these past couple weeks, it looked like he could he could have lost. Even though you might think to yourself, all right, there's no way he's losing. They gave us as a viewer kind of that, oh, well, wait, dang. You know, that was a close two. And... I like that, and you know what? Credit to him, too. Like, he gives his opponents enough offense to make it so believable because if you would have just looked at this before they even started the match, you you know, the mo the common viewer would probably think, man, Cage is just going to run through him, just throw him all over the ring. But Takashi got a lot of offense in, and I like that. And I think this whole Cage World Tour gimmick is going to help him. I just hope... You know, moving forward, you know, eventually when they have him uh, competing back in Impact, they have some kind of feud that can really catapult him into that next level because sooner, soon he's going to be in title contention for whichever title, you know, who knows. But him racking up all these wins, you would imagine that eventually it's going to lead to some sort of title shot. 100% agreement. Absolutely. You couldn't have said it better that we, we made the comparison between Goldberg, but he's making his opponents look good in defeat. You know, every week, you know, he's making them look like they've worked for it. But at the same time, he's not damaging his brand. You know, he's taken on some tough fights. And I think he's, he's been a revelation, really has. And they did something similar with Moose, where he was doing the kind of world tour thing. But this seems so much better. Uh, I don't know if it was the interview I've done with Moose this week. But, you know, this guy for me is chalk and cheese, you know, head, head and heels above where, where Moose is, even now. You know, so uh, we talked about Slammiversary. By the way, I asked Moose about that because you said uh, you think he's going to win the title of Slammiversary. I said Bound for Glory. He just said it depends what creatives say. So he didn't give us any clues there. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I thought that the Brian Cage in this match and also Takeshi, uh, Takashi was, was fantastic. You know, it was just, yeah, so many near falls. It, it was just, you know, the only match of the night that made me feel, wow, I could watch another five, ten minutes of this. But anyway, um, we then had a recap, uh, and it was quite a good recap, actually. Um, although they showed the whole match again, and, you know, this is, you know, you're saying about having things from other promotions, and we had two back to back, then you had a recap. And this is what really killed the life of, of the show for me, you know, because you just had a great Brian Cage match, and all this was good. You feel like at this point you needed something in the impact zone. And uh, I love the finish. I don't know who was playing suicide. I'm guessing it might have been Christopher Daniels, who, by the way, likes to drink a certain type of drink. Let us know what it is in the comments. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I quite like this. And I know you don't like the suicide character, but I quite like the finish of this. They, um, in the on the UKS broadcasting, they didn't show the full match. They showed, they uh, dubbed this pretty much as the moment of the week. And it was, they just showed some, some parts of the match and then they showed the finish. I do believe it was Christopher Daniels because there's a fan you see in the audience it says bring Christopher Daniels back so I think he was referring to you know the suicide character but they yeah they didn't show the full the full match and it's weird with how they're doing these flashbacks because on one end they'll give us you know a quick you know three to five minute flashback which is fine then on sometimes they give us the full match so it's kind of been inconsistent so I mean you know you take it for what it is I, and I think this showing showing it how they showed it you know and obviously if you want to see the full match you can catch it on the app i think this is the best way to display these flashback matches okay so next up we had <laughs> another segment which i really didn't like and i and i usually like these kind of things but it seemed like it was uh someone in high school doing a horror movie project and editing it himself but we had ali staring into the mirror with some terrible cutaway edits and these kind of things. And, and I think this is most probably the worst time ever to do this segment because the last time we saw a segment in the mirror like this, it was actually winter in the mirror. Uh, it was obviously just returned tonight. So halfway through this, I was like thinking, is, is, is it going to be Catriona, you know, staring in, into the mirror? And then they turn around, she's not there. But I, I just thought this once again, Ali's acting basically consists of her ruffling her eyebrows. 
um, it's the Kirsten Dunst School of Acting. And I just thought that this wasn't very good. Although I am excited about seeing the uh, Sue Young funeral of Rosemary next week. Yeah, this was kind of just a, you know, we talk about hit and misses. This was just a miss for me. But, you know, I guess it's just to continue the storyline between Ali, Rosemary and Sue Young. I'm glad that they are continuing it. And let's forget about it because last week it ended with that. You know, that was the last image we saw. And we didn't see anything about it really until this bit. Um, but it, it just, do you know what I mean? But the editing of it, it seems like someone's recorded a horror film on their phone, you know, and has done some really crude editing. It just seems, you know, oh, a close up of a door handle being turned, you know, <laughs> and those kind of things. And I, they did the same with the Sammy Callahan at the hospital, the, the, the hotel and all these kind of things. I don't like this type of editing. The packages are brilliant, but but these segments, I don't know. It, it really does feel like they've got a really second rate director to do them. Uh, and it annoys me because the old stuff, like the funeral of aces and eights, the, the, the search for Willow, uh, even when, Ken Anderson went to um, Sam Shaw's house, all these kind of things. They were really well done. This, though, it, it's like a high school project, and it, it bugs me because the show could have been brilliant with just a better director. Anyway, that's rant over. Uh, usually I'm talking about, oh, did you notice uh, the shoes that so-and-so was wearing? This week I'm ranting. And talking about uh, Christopher Daniels' drinks, let us know in the comments, folks. Right, okay, on to the main event. Pentagon Jr. versus Eli Drake. Uh, what did you think of this? Um, I mean, there's been better matches involving Eli Drake, obviously. Um, it was fine. I want to get your thoughts before I get into what's been my uh, biggest criticism. And I will add this. You know, I've enjoyed, you know, not being familiar with Pentagon. I've enjoyed him thus far in Impact. Um, he brings something, you know, it's different different than what I'm accustomed to seeing when I'm looking at a lot of uh, mask wrestlers. So he's been a welcome addition to the roster. But I want to get your thoughts before I get into my criticism. First of all, he's a scary idiot, isn't he? Um, <laughs> um, okay, but my views on this match is that Eli Drake is absolutely riding a wave of popularity his wrestling's improved all these kind of things he you know he's a tag champ they built this up as a major thing and i felt that the match was really short for for someone cashing in their belt it, well cashing in his belt sorry cashing in the the suitcase uh when he could have cashed it in at the end of a match or whatever it is it seemed like we've given it to eli He's not signed his new contract. Let's not put the belt on him. Let's get it off him quickly. Let's give it a quite short match. This could have gone another 10 minutes. They could have added another 10 minutes to this match, cut out the Congo Kong crap, and had a really good fight. You know, But this was, it was okay. But it, this felt like it could have been KM versus Matt Sedell. You know, it, it, it didn't feel like a world championship match to me. See, and now my criticism, here's where my criticism comes in. So, and just follow it, okay? Moose had the briefcase, okay? We have Eli take the brief, briefcase from Moose. And I had thought maybe Moose was injured because I know a lot of times when we see the briefcases change hands, you know, that's their way of writing off somebody who's, you know, dealing with injury, okay? So then I had thought with Eli getting the, the world title case that eventually down the road, between now and Slammiversary, he'd cash in, become champion, and then we'd have a returning Moose challenging Eli just for the simple fact that Eli took his briefcase, okay? You know, obviously Eli and Steiner are tag team champions, so I really thought for the time being, there was really no incentive for Eli to cash in his world title shot anytime soon. We get the cash in, and he loses in this short match. So... A, what was the point of them taking the briefcase off of Moose? And B, why have him cash in right away when he's already a tag tag team champion? They couldn't have milked this and ha maybe have him challenge at a pay-per-view and do the cash in there. It just seemed like, you know, creative had an idea, then kind of just scrapped it entirely and just wanted to get the briefcase out of Eli's hands because you could have easily just had him just carrying it around and milking it for a couple of months. So that's where my criticism comes in, where it's like it just seemed like a waste of a, a cash in. 
Does it seem to you that this signifies and all, you know, all signs point to Eli is going to be going? Because as you quite really said, they could have milked this for, for a long time. But with this, it makes you feel like they've given it to him and they haven't come to terms. So they need to get the belt off him. Let, let's, you know, let's just get him lose it. You know, I would think that more if we see them lose the tag team titles abruptly then I guess you could can think that because I know they said or when you had interviewed with him, his contract was up in May. Now, I don't know if he had signed. Did, did he state about signing an extension for two months or the two months that he signed ran his contract till May? Uh, I think he did. Uh, originally, when I interviewed him, he said the end of May. But since then, there was some stuff about him um, extending his contract until I think a Slammiversary pay-per-view. Quite possibly, uh, so that would be July. That would make sense. Uh, so I, I think that uh, it wasn't me who asked that question. Although I did ask him on the teleconference subsequently, and he said there's still no contract. So you're quite right. Uh, there's a tag team title next week, and I hope it they win because if it does, it means he's staying around. But uh, we'll have to wait and see, won't we? Yeah, it just it's confusing, and I mean, in you know we're getting the new tapings in I think the first week of June, so that'll be telling. With that said, if they lose Eli, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm still going to follow the product, but that's a bad blow because I really think he's the guy that you can build around. I mean, him and Austin Aries, you know, we're always talking about, you know, where they have champions and really no one that's on the same level as who they put the title on to work with. So, and it was so funny is, you know, if he does resign, then we're back to this. Well, why'd you even go through all that? You know, maybe they decided to take the briefcase off him because, you know, they want to negotiate the contract. But once again, if you, if you intend to keep him on board, just keep him with the briefcase. And then if you can't come to terms, you can obviously just have him drop it. Then it just seems so abrupt and just seemed like a waste. And once again, like I said, you know, knew his contract situation. Why would you take the briefcase off of Moose then when you know Moose is under contract for, you know, uh, I forget how, how his contract is. It just, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you take, taking the briefcase off of Moose, putting it on Eli just to have Eli cash in and lose. In the track record with the world title shot, uh, Feaster fired, there's only been one person to successfully cash in. He's no longer with the company, and that's uh, Drew Drew Galloway. So another thing I was thinking, too, maybe this was their way of kind of like doing away with the concept. I, I, I kind of feel like this new regime wasn't even sold on the Feaster fired. That was just their way of getting rid of EC3. But once again, if you if you weren't behind the concept, you could have easily you know, just done a loser least town match and been, been through with it. So that was just my criticism. It just, it made no sense. And, you know, to do that to Eli, if you're going to have this type of match, you know, you put on a 10, 12 minute match, you know, cause he's capable of that. And I think he's earned that right. So, I mean, we just got to see, and hopefully, you know, they resign him, but you know, we'll see. Absolutely. And I think we've been pretty much on the same page all episode this week, you know, that we thought that they could have done a lot differently that made it so much better. But it just, you know, like some of the matches, it didn't seem to click this week. And having said that, next week, you know, looks like a good show. Tag team titles. We got uh, the funeral of Rosemary, which I think will be entertaining. Hopefully they'll get uh, someone not from fifth grade, but maybe, you know, someone, you know, in their sophomore year or something like that <laughs> to, to edit it. Um, yeah, I think it should be a good show next week and it'll bounce back. And I reckon that if they've had so much filler this week, it's because they may be holding some stuff back for next week and want to make it a good show. But um, yeah, that's it. I, I mean, unless you've got anything else to add, was, was there anything else on the, the show next week? Yeah, just uh, I'll do a quick rundown. I, I know you had uh, mentioned some of the matches, but I'll just uh, run it one more time. We get a we have a tag team title match, and I'm gonna assume this is the main event. But it's Eli Drake and Scott Steiner defending the Impact tag team titles against DJ Z and Andrew Everett. Then we're also getting Kiera Kiera. I'm sorry, Hogan versus Tessa Blanchard. This will be Tessa Blanchard's in ring in ring debut for, with Impact Wrestling. We're also gonna get the Callahan versus Edwards at House of Hardcore. Brian Cage's World Tour, and then the funeral of Rosemary. So, you know, solid. I'm I'm interested to see what happens, and especially with that tag team title match after we just had talked about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
Uh, yeah, as uh, Rose said, a stacked card next week. It really does look like it's a good show on paper. Uh, so make sure you do tune in and hear our review as well. And if this is your first time stopping by the channel, as we said at the beginning, hit subscribe. Hopefully you've enjoyed today's show. Leave us a like or a dislike. We don't care. Um, as long as you actually take the time to show us love or hate one way or the other. And do, don't forget as well to leave us some comments. We love getting your questions. We love interacting with our audience. So make sure you ask us a question and we'll do our best to answer it on the show next week. And it will be the return of the trivia question next week as well. And just a re final reminder, although I've reminded you all the way through the show and I'm about to go and have another one. What is Christopher Daniels' drink um that he used to carry to the ring and drink backstage which i've been having one or two of during the show today so let us know in the comments uh but for the time being uh make sure you tune into the channel because there's going to be other things like the moose interview but that's all from me yeah everybody take care thanks for listening